Welcome everybody to the first panel discussion of this year's DKF. Uh, very pleased to, to be back here. Um, like I said already a few minutes ago, we have a bit of a challenge in that uh, the time that is available for this panel discussion is going to be a little bit shorter because we also want to stay to the schedule of the streams that start at 10. So we'll keep this um, well, short and sweet as much as we can without sort of compromising the topic and uh, the things we want to discuss. The panel discussion. How did the pandemic help our industry to accelerate new data services and, and technology? As Alexis said in his introduction, a lot has happened in the last two, three years, and uh, some of it is going to stay. At the beginning of the pandemic, now over two years ago, we saw user firms scrambling to find w new ways of working, new structures and procedures for running the daily business, and figure out how to collaborate. In our first virtual DKF two years ago, we actually talked about uh, how firms were getting organized in, in, uh, in, in working uh, from home. And in the end, it all went very well. As we know, working from home, it works. It would appear to have started a, a, a process by end user firms to consider external solutions, such as managed services and outsourcing. So COVID has pushed us into the world, working from home and in the virtual way of working world. And we have embraced virtual and cloud-based management and distribution and consumption of data, investing in controlled processes and technologies that make this possible. Now that COVID restrictions are rolling back in many places, these practices are here to stay, uh, given the transparency, the control, and the efficiency that they are bringing. So this panel will discuss these developments and the resulting new normal. In our discussion, we will focus on things like the market data procurement, the business use, financial markets, the vendors, and the technology. I would now like to ask the panel members to introduce themselves, explaining also a bit about what their uh, role is in the market data world. Andrea Kreuterbrühl, first. Yeah, so my name is Andrea Kreuterbrühl. I'm somehow speaking louder than Evert Jan, you do, but <laughs> I don't know how it seems that you can hear me better. Um, so I'm from Commerzbank. Um, I'm uh, in charge for big data advanced analytics for the cluster market data. We have a group wide responsibility for market data the, from, from the business demand as well as the commercials, um, as well as the technology which we provide to the group and across the group basically. Um, and we do also a group-wide market data cost management within BDA market data. I have a background in mathematics, um, and I have taken on, um, I have worked on a lot of risk and rating model development um, in the past and have taken on various management roles um, in this area at Deutsche Bank, at Resner, um, and then later at Commerzbank. Thank you, Andrea. My name is Stefan Weikert. Um, I'm responsible for the financial markets business at FORCE, and I'm a market data enthusiast. So I love dealing with uh, complex market data related problems of any kind. Um, I'm doing so, and I did so also in, in former roles. Uh, before FORCE, I worked as a freelance consultant, um, and before that, I I uh, had several roles at HBB Unicredit, among them head of market risk and head of market data. Thank you. Yeah. Milton. Milton. Milton Davison, uh, Elaba Invest, market data procurement is uh, my area of responsibility. Uh, I cover the contractual side, the administrative side, uh, yeah, pretty much everything except usage. Uh, prior to that, I had a similar role with another uh, major Landesbank, and prior experience is as a uh, procurement manager and product manager with various vendors. Alex? Um, my name is Alex Wolf. I head strategy at Rhymes. Uh, Rhymes uh, has honed its skills in data management uh, with originally a focus in benchmark data management for the last 25 years which is roughly the same time that I have worked in the capital markets, everything from uh, risk to systems to strategy consultancy, uh, always around uh, data and the f basically 
data being the foundation of, of all of the information that we provide at RIMES. The interesting thing now is, the, is, is, is from a strategic perspective, what I'm overseeing is this uh, evolution uh, to the cloud, to more management services that is taking place, uh, partially be, uh, accelerated through the uh, pandemic. Yeah. So that's uh, why I'm super excited to be on this panel. Very good. And I work for a company called TUG Screen. What we do is help uh, financial services firms optimize their enterprise spend. I thought I would get that in as well. So the first question then, um, what changes have we seen through the pandemic impacting market data services and technology? Andre, you would like to answer that first, I believe. Yeah, I think uh, the pand pandemic has actually been a driver for digitization as we all have seen it and automation um, actually, so also the drive to cloud, cloud migration is a big topic all over. And also the provision of APIs is, is of course a big driver for all of us and is helping us a lot um, to um, connect market data services much quicker than we could, it, could it have done in the past. So this has really have had a po positive impact on the technology um, as well as on APIs. Um, especially for Commerzbank, uh, we have set up our so-called delivery organization where we all drive the change projects and we have um, established an HI culture. And we were, we were a bit skeptical how this is up and running uh, through the pandemic. But yeah, after, we, after a few weeks, months, establishing everything, uh, tools have developed rapidly, basically, um, in this whole setup. And at the end, it has turned out and it has helped us a lot and through new technologies which have been come up, um, we have basically accelerated this process too, so no negative impact on that. On the other hand, we also see that um, the way to cloud is really a tough one. Um, this is related to the resources, so um, a lot of the people have worked on premise. This is true for, for financial institutions, but this is also true for the vendors. So it's hard to um, basically grow up the knowledge um, across for cloud technology, which you actually need if you want to work um, with various cloud providers and want to bring your applications into the cloud. Um, so this is, of course, a key topic for all of us and where we see there's still a huge demand for further developments um, and it will take longer than we expected it to be. Yeah. You represent the Commerce Bank of Sellside, the institution. Milton, you basically are on the buy side, so to speak. Uh, uh, Andre already mentioned that you know the dealings with vendors have changed as well. What, how did that work from from your perspective? What did, did you see? How vendors responded in the post and during COVID times? For the vendors, I think. One of the biggest things that we saw was there was a very fast response in helping us uh, accelerate that our uh, users could work you know, outside of the office, go into the home office, uh, which was a great thing. Obviously, that also for us, some was a technological challenge to ensure you know, if there's firewalls that the users could actually access what they needed to access. Uh, but now, we're also seeing slowly but surely the vendor starting to say, okay, you know, we were generous with you for the last two years. Now we need to start, you know, looking at getting back to what I would call it the new normal. You know, so it's somewhere between pre-pandemic, you know, uh, we're gonna stop being so generous with how you access our services from outside of your office to finding a business model that, you know, is kind of a, I call it a hybrid. Uh, so you have the challenge of, first of all, coming to terms with the vendors, and obviously also the technological aspect of it is making sure that your IT you know, can provide the opportunity for your users to use the services you know, from home. At the same time, of course, making sure that all the data and yeah, your IT infrastructure is still safe. So that's one of our, those are our two biggest challenges right there in that aspect. Uh, also though, from what I would like to add from a procurement 
point of view. Uh, I think one of the big changes is that we all have to adapt to as a procurement uh, people is doing business via, uh, you know, call, video calls. Uh, my personal belief is uh, most of the relationships, you know, our dealings with the vendor is on a certain personal level. And of course you can have that call, and, you know, and you see the face, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the sitting together across the table and talking with each other uh, is just something that, at least personally for me in the last two years, I've come to realize, you know, it's an important part of the business, not just your knowledge, having a plan, but actually just being able to sit, you know, and actually look into the eyes, not, you know, at a video screen and seeing the eyes. You know, because you're probably thinking anyway, I wonder, you know, is he wearing shorts, sweats, or actually jeans, so. <laughs> Makes a big difference, as we can all tell being here. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about uh, managed service and outsourcing. Alex, from your perspective, what, what, is, what is going on and what has been going on since the, in the last two years? So, what we see, and I think what, uh, what, what, what is universally true, I think Andrea was uh, alluding to it already, is we, we see an, an acceleration of looking at each part of the data management value chain and looking of how to most efficiently be able to deliver that. I would break it into three parts, technology, processes, and expertise. Technology, I think we are past the point where we have realized that you do not need to run the technology, the hardware, the software on premise in your basement. Uh, it, during COVID, that was a problem, uh, but beyond being a problem, it is actually a, a benefit being able to, to move that on, uh, into the cloud, into a shared service, have somebody uh, provide that service to you on the basis of a particular SLA so that you know you get the best service. The next is process. So rather than just the software, can you outsource the mechanics, the, the actual cranking of the handle, if you will, uh, around not only maintaining the software, but potentially even the, the processes of the data, data management itself. This is wh where we had uh, carved our, our, our area of expertise as a company. So we were providing that for one particular data type, for, for index data originally. And what we have seen is uh, customers, uh, our clients asking us, to be able to provide that for other types of data and for broader processes. So it's not only index uh, uh, data, it is, um, it is uh, security data, it's, it's the security master, it's uh, pricing masters. And uh, to the topic that Patricia was talking about, ESG data is, is a huge topic in that context because you have so much um, heterogeneity in terms of uh, processes. You have good quality in areas, but you don't have consistency. So. Uh, uh, having somebody manage that and uh, getting that expertise and outsourcing that to a best of breed solution is something that we see accelerating. And then the last bit is what I would call, I already alluded to it, is expertise. It's, it's outsourcing an outcome as opposed to just a process. So you are looking for a particular piece of your value chain. Uh, you're looking for data that is ready to be consumed to your policy uh, in a place, rather than just outsourcing the software or the process, you can outsource the whole process to a particular player, uh, uh, to, to a particular provider, who you can then hold accountable for the outcome, as opposed to for a mechanical step in between. And what, was, what we are seeing is an acceleration and acceptance of the ability to provide your core value proposition, your core services better by outsourcing some of these parts uh, to providers, uh, to, to outside providers, who then provide that uh, type of service in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So what I hear is that it's a lot about expertise, right? Knowing, uh, you know, what is suitable for, for managed service and for outsourcing and what not. And I think in, 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 in he hearing, you know, various people already uh, over the past few weeks, the expertise is hard to come by these days within banks, right? You know, the market data expertise is not so easy to get anymore. So, Stefan, how, how do you see that being discussed then at your, your clients? You're a consultant. You, you work with those banks and try yeah. to help them understand, you know, what can be managed outside and what not. How do they go about it? 
Well, I think without a doubt the managed data services are or is, are going to be successful business models, yeah, because the scaling effects are too huge, yeah. Um, but um, there's no, say, standard use case which fits for every organization. So um, this has to be clearly and deeply analyzed. Yeah? And uh, a lot of organizations have to do some homework before that decision can, can even be taken. Yeah? And I want to highlight some aspects uh, here. First of all, the requirements. Um, it's very hard to come up with a list of aggregated requirements for the whole organization. Yeah? The stakeholders are spread all over the organization. They have very different use cases and requirements, uh, be it um, data quality, be it formats to be delivered, be it frequency. Um, so you need a lot of knowledge and expertise to aggregate those requirements. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, in which situation are you, say, um, considering costs and budget constraints? Yeah? Some um, organizations are in cost-cutting programs. Uh, some need to, to reduce human resources. That is, it's in favor, of course, of managed services. But at the end of the day, you, you need, need, need uh, the money um, that you can spend for, for these services. Um, Governance, maybe one more thing. I, I mentioned already the stakeholders are spread over the organization, so is there really a clear governance on who is going to s decide on that, not only for one project, but continuously? And last but not least, <coughs> um, risk appetite for those services. Um, yeah, what does it mean? Um, if you go for it, you will always have a yeah, a brain drain, and so you lose knowledge within the organization. And the question is, how much of it are you willing to accept? So you would maybe not go for outsourcing something which has a strategic relevance for your company. Yeah? You wouldn't do that, and vice versa, of course. Um, maybe you, want, you don't want to be dependent um, on, on only one vendor. Yeah? Uh, also a thing to consider. Um, and last point, I see also systemic risk. Yeah? Um, if you think about oligopolistic, if not monopolistic structures already visible in the market data environment, if you now outsource valuations, um, I see systemic risks there. Because if mistakes are made or somebody starts to cheat, I think the valuation world has a problem and every organization has. Are there some more examples of, of you know, data sets that really cannot be outsourced because of like strategic importance or, or you know, we, at the screen, I give an example. We have clients in the US hedge funds, right? And we manage their subscription spend. But, you know, we have to sign lengthy, uh, you know, uh, disclaimers that we are not going to use any of that knowledge whatsoever because as you can imagine those hedge funds you know they the fact that they look at certain data is already for them you know a strategic consideration like i don't want anyone else to know about it do we have similar considerations in the commerce funds <coughs> yeah i would say everything what has um, a huge commercial impact is something where we want to take our own decisions basically and would never outsource is maybe parts of the analysis can be outsourced but everything what has a huge commercial impact is clearly something which we would hold um, in commerce bank and everything you know what stefan was outlining has an impact on our valuations as well as model competencies you know for the for the derivation of market data you have always internal models which you apply and where you um, had to get your regulatory approval for that. This is, of course, something which we would like to keep internally and have the knowledge internally, as well as the knowledge on, I would say, core technology, core technologies which we would like to keep internally. But there are also huge parts which are definitely in favor of outsourcing. So, of course, this cloud topic is a topic where I believe are we as financial institutions really the best ones to manage our hardware? 
No, I'm not convinced that we are. Um, there are. I'm more in favor to go into the direction, really go to the big cloud providers um, and set up a proper strategy so that you not only work with one, rather with several cloud providers um, instead of being dependent on one cloud provider. They have the knowledge, they can help us to establish this. Of course, we also need <coughs> internal people and still internal resources. This is also important, you know, who can run that this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have time for one <coughs> quickie, one additional topic, and uh, that's actually to do with this other thing that is going on now. Alexis mentioned already Ukraine, the war, and all the uh, actions that are being taken by banks and by asset managers to reduce their exposure. Milton, how is that working for Hilaba? What do you have to do? Is it, uh, is it manageable? Uh, good, good question. <laughs> is it manageable? Uh, I, I think you learn to live with it. I mean, you have the challenges that you're facing is obviously you didn't have any prep time. You know, this came basically overnight. And so how do you, you know, deal with the fact that all of a sudden you have indices that don't have Russian, all the Russian components were taken out. How do you deal with uh, assets that you hold where payments are due? You know, do you, at what point do you put them into default? How do you, you know, price them? That's the, I think that's the biggest challenge. And uh, for us, as uh, not only just being a Kafal gay, but also Mazda Kafal gay, uh, kind of doubles the issue because first of all, we have to worry about our own portfolio, but obviously you also have your clients, you know, who are sitting in, and breathing down your neck asking, you know, how are you gonna deal with this? You know, because I mean, obviously you still hold the instruments. How are we gonna value them, you know? And uh, that for us is the, currently the biggest challenge we have is between how do you value the assets and how do you deal with these indices that all of a sudden are missing a big chunk, you know, especially obviously in the emerging markets. Uh, and I think that for us currently is the biggest, the two biggest obviously with the, at what point do you put the paper into default because there's no more payments coming, or even such questions as, okay, so they'll pay in rubles, but you know, we don't have a bank account, we can't take rubles, so is it a default or is it not a default? And there really isn't much guidance coming from uh, any regulatory authority, so it's pretty much, you know, you know, you know good luck figuring it out. Yeah. Alex, quickly. It's, it's actually a really good uh, example where, uh, from a process perspective, this is one where, uh, for our clients, we work as the, I guess, the first port of call from the data providers uh, on the index side, MSCI, uh, FTSE, Russell, et cetera, et cetera. We, we got the data, we, we saw the changes that were made, the exclusions that were made, the approach and the different approach that different service providers took in uh, handling this, this issue. And we were able, and it was a lot of work, but we were able to work that out at, at that level once for all of our clients and then be able to pass that data on to, or to make the changes to our clients to, to normalize the data in a way that our clients requested mm -hmm. as opposed to necessarily one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it points to the, to the scale economies that, uh, that, that uh, were addressed earlier uh, around being able to, to handle these types of things on a, on a utility basis, if you will. So you don't want to be dependent on one vendor, you want to do it through, you, you yep. want to continue your relationship with many of them, but you can standardize some of the handling across those vendors yep. uh, and, and, and share that expertise across the industry. Yep. Stefan, something to add? <laughs> you know, maybe just one thing, I feel like these kind of events are getting more and more frequent, yeah, and that we need a lot of attention, risk management-wise, of course. And this is simply slowing down project work. Yeah? I remember in, in February, we were in the middle of a project, and uh, <laughs> one of the people saying, hey, sorry, I can't, I have to take care for Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we had that too, yeah. Uncharted territory.
looking at the clock, 59. We need some minutes as well to, to make our way to the various uh, rooms the, in the rest of the building. Like I said, ESG is upstairs. The rest of the stream rooms uh, are on this floor. I want to thank the panel, Andrea, Tim Stefan, Milton, and Alex for, the, for this discussion. Thank you very much for the expertise. <laughs> See you later today.